Hello everyone, in this playthrough we are going to beat Elden Ring using only dark damage type sorceries and armaments. We will also do this run without leveling up, relying solely on stat boosting items such as great runes, talismans, crystal tears and equipment with special effects. For this run we will follow the game's progression route, which means we will be navigating through Elden Ring's world in the sequence intended by the game's design. We kick off our adventure on Nimgrave as usual. Before delving into our primary build, let's ensure we secure the essentials. Stormhill for the Strength of Crystal Tear, the High Road Cave for the Blue Dancer Charm, Summon Water Village for the Turtle Talisman, and finally the Mistwoods for the X Talisman, as well as the Spiked Crack Tear and Greenspool Crystal Tear. Next, we'll make halt at the seaside ruins where we can grab our first gravity ash of war. Defeating the alabaster lord here will reward us over the ash of war gravitas. After that I'll make my way to the weeping peninsula where I will first off cheat the death bird using kukri and arrows for the sacrificial axe which is not a dark magic or magic weapon at all, however it is dropped by the death birds and therefore I think it suits into our build. Moving on to the church of pilgrimage where I'll be farming for the bandit's curved sword which is dropped by the bandit skeletons around the graveyard. If this is a weapon used by skeletons, I think it is a fitting weapon for those embracing the realm of death. Our next checkpoint brings us to the Weeping Everjail for the Radagon Scar Seal, which we must first earn by defeating the ancient hero of the moor. Yeah, I fucked up here. Oh, Scheiße. Are you fucking kidding me? Finally. Finally I have this now. So that's great. Next ahead we have to go to the tombs for catacombs. As you can see over there is an imp statue and behind that fog we can pick up a cookbook that will let us craft rancor pots. At the tomb sword catacombs we can also farm grave violets which are needed for crafting rancor pots. Now that we can craft rancor pots it's time to pick up some cracked pots. I will be purchasing the cracked pots that Callie has to offer from him. And then go to the Grooveside Cave for yet another cracked pot. Oh, he has a cracked pot, so I'm, I'll be purchasing that one. Also be purchasing the, crack, the cracked pot from the Merchant and the Weeping. And before we leave the Weeping Peninsula, it is time to defeat the region boss. I don't like being stuck.
Bro, I don't have any more. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Okay. Now that we've gathered all the essential items, let's head to the Castle Ward Tunnel. I'll take a leap off the cliff in Margaret's boss arena to exit the round table hold. Here I can upgrade my weapon to plus 5 using the smithing stones I have collected. After that I am ready to fade the challenges in the boss arena. For this fight, I am using my Bandit's Curved Sword plus 5, as well as Rancor Pods. I actually wanted to throw stuff. Come on, I don't have much left. <laughs> I wonder if there was one more. Yeah, maybe there was one that sold more crack pots. Great! After speaking to Nefeli Lu, collecting all the smithing stones and cracked pots here in Stormwind Castle, there's nothing else to do and therefore we can go ahead with the boss fight. For this fight I'm using my Bandit's Curved Sword plus 7 and Rancor Pots. What are you doing? Do something else then!
probably going to do that again. Finally! With Godric's great rune in hand, it's time to journey to Storm Hill and reach the Divine Tower of Limgrave. There, I can activate the great rune and unlock its power. We have finally reached Leonia of Lakes. Let us make our way to the Leskier Ruins. In the northwest section of the Leskier Ruins, we find steps leading down to an underground room. In here, we can grab the Wrath Calling Bell. The ding 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 ding. These dudes drop a Grave Violet. So if you're lucky, you may have the chance of grabbing Grave Violets from the them so i actually like farming the grave violet from these dudes but jarbrook is definitely a lot better with the grave violets so we will actually next ahead to go and find jarbrook i'll be picking up all of the uh, nice pots here so one crack pot another crack pot and up ahead there is the next crack pot it's a bit boring doing this, but this is for a nice lazy afternoon, you know, I just sit and I just pluck flowers for like an hour and then I have enough grape violets so that I can basically run through an entire area without having to worry about crafting my pots, basically. I will now make my way all the way to the Black Knife Catagom. I'm not gonna go through the catagoms, I'm simply going there to pick up Rose's X and we'll leave right after that. Next, we will pick up the Dexterity Knot Crystal here, which we can find at the top of a small island west of the scenic isle side of grace okay here we are in raya lucari crystal tunnel once again as usual i'll run through the area and meet you guys at the boss of fog gate let's go in and deal with that crystallion and get our hands on the miner's bell bearing was nice alrighty there we go next ahead I'll make my way inside the lakeside crystal cave there's really nothing here for me but I need to pick up a smithing stone 4 and therefore I'm gonna go through this cave now Moving around so much.
I'm on my fuck sake, dude. Stop mo Oh, God, I don't have anything left. Are you kidding me? Stupid asshole. Moved far too much. Okay, next ahead, I will make my way in to the Academy Crystal Cave, since at the far end of the Crystal Cave, we can pick up the Terra Magica spell. Oh, great, I just have one, that's wonderful. I need to switch now. Yeah, I have no stamina. Terra Magica, there we go, finally. Before confronting the next boss, we will secure the Elevina's Glintstone crown from near the schoolhouse site of Grace. This crown enhances intelligence by three, enabling us to wield the X of Roses with the additional intelligence gained. For this fight, I am using Roses X plus three, as well as my Rancor pots. to use my summons. After the fight, we find one more cracked pot next to some living jars. On the balcony above the Church of the Cuckoo, we can take down a tiny crystallized crab to acquire the Twin Sage Glintstone Crown, which enhances our intelligence by 6. For the fight with Renala, I'm using Rosa's X plus 4, as well as the Sacrificial X. The later is used to birth the bubbles that are cast on the girls. The Sacrificial X restores a little bit of my FP each time an enemy is defeated. Yeah, 
If the girls end up falling on my head, then that's it. How it is. Where is she? Oh, over there. God damn it. I swear to God. What the fuck was this shit even? It's fine. There will be there will be time. There will be time to drink it. Yeah, yeah. always get hit in this fight i've already given up i've already given up like whenever i have to do this fight i'm like yeah it's fine i'm, I'm gonna get hit I, I already know it so now that we're here in north lyurnia we're gonna go and pick up the intel not crystal tier which we find down below here so let us go get it before going to carry a manor, let us uh, grab uh, the magic shrouding cracked tear from uh, the minor earth tree avatar. Oh, I forgot to drink my wondrous physique. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, well, it worked in the end, so it's fine. There's nothing here for me at Carrier Manor, and thus I'm simply going to run through until I get to the area boss, which is Royal Knight Loretta. And I'm simply gonna use Rose's X. With Loretta defeated, I'm making my way through these three sisters to find Rani since her questline triggers Radan Festival. <laughs> I'm breaking everything. I'm going below through the well in the mistwood. See if I can't find the road to Nokron. Don't keep me waiting, eh? We're now in Siafra River where we find the Dragon Kin soldier, but before I go ahead and fight the dragonkin soldier i'll actually pick up marika's scar seal since i think it's just easier to pick it up before i deal with the uh, dragonkin i don't even need to actually deal with this boss but it's fine
Ragnarok and Nor. After defeating the Dragonkin soldier, our next destination is Salavus. He had the quest for us, but let's put that on hold for now. Armed with his recommendation, our focus turns to Salin in the Waypoint Ruins. She holds information to unlocking the Redan Festival. But before we can get to her, we have to defeat the mad pumpkin head who is blocking our way. Uh, Oh my god, I'm so tired of this helmet! Ugh, oh, god shun. Upon gathering vital information from Salen, our journey takes us back to Blythe, who will await us in Redmain Castle. Now it's time for us to hit the road to Kaelid. So here we are in Kaelid. There are a few items that we can grab in this area. One is down below there, you can already see the imp statue. I have already activated my stone sword key and now we can pick up the sword of Saint Trina. We continue our journey by seeking out Gauri. Located in a shack near Celia, he holds a powerful sorcery essential to our build. A great sage, in my day anyway. To obtain the quest item crucial for our progression, Gauri requires us to defeat Commander Neil. I will utilize the environment strategically to cheese Commander Neil. This approach takes some time and therefore patience is required. Once the quest item is in our possession, we return to Gauri. He will guide us to our next task, which is to locate Millicent, found at the Church of the Plague. To reach her, we must first unlock Celia Gateway by lighting the towers scattered throughout Celia. I must not forget to pick up the Staff of Loss here as well. Upon handling over the quest item, Millicent will reward us with the Prothesis Talisman, boosting Dexterity by 5. This is a valuable item for this build. We can head back to Gauri to continue our quest. Now it's time to acquire the coveted Night Maiden's Mist, a potent sorcery. Armed with the Night Maiden's Mist, we return to the Church of Plague and follow the road north to the Swamp Lookout Tower. We spot a distant big skull and climb it, employing the Night Maiden's Mist to efficiently cheat the Death Bird. This method may take some time but guarantees safety and effectiveness. We have to exercise patience for a successful outcome. Having triumphed over the death bird, our spoils include the death poker. Before pressing forward, let's make a brief detour back to the round table hold. Here we receive a pouch from Enya as a reward for acquiring two great runes. Before continuing our journey towards Redmain Castle, we must make a stop at Fort Gale. Here inside a chest, we find the Star Scorch Talisman, an artifact that bestows its wearer with plus 5 strength. Now the festival awaits, promising an epic fight.
Yeah, but I was far away this time around. Oh my god! I didn't even, even do anything! Right. With the fallen star beneath the earth. Having emerged victorious over the formidable Radan, our next destination beckons to Nokron, a realm that harbored the Finger Slayer Blade. Here we can confront the Erebus for an extra thrill. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's gonna do that shit in a moment. No, no, get him! Get him. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we have to hold off on returning to Rani for now, as there's a task at hand in Salavis questline. But before delving into that, let's take a detour to Dragonbearer, where we claim the Radagon Sword Seal and gather high tier smithing stones to augment our arsenal. Now with Dragonbearer's treasures secured, we turn our attention to Salavis quest. I am Nefeli Lu. Warrior. Convincing Nefali to drink Saliva's potion proves kind of challenging. Medicine? I have no need of it. I am a warrior. I need no external aid. 
Oh really? Well, I can't do anything without my flats of wondrous physique. Respect to you, girl! On our initial attempt, Nefeli refused. We find her next in the village of the Albinarix. I am Nefeli Lu, warrior. I think I got that. To continue the quest line, we must confront the Omen Killer miniboss before returning back to the round table hold. Great job. Okay, uh, the dude went back, so I need to actually come here again. And now he's back. Mr. Omen Killer. Oh, really? Oh, well, okay. Why is it on my rank for poison? I don't think I can... I have anything to... Yeah, I don't have Grave Violets again. So now I need to go back to Jarburg and farm Grave Violets. Great job. Back at the round table hold, we will find Nefeli dejected and distressed. This is the opportune moment to persuade her to drink the potion. With success, we can return to Celevis. The journey now leads to Altus Plateau. Since Celevis tasks us with acquiring the Ember Starlight Shard. Ember Shard we find here. So it's uh, northeast from the Altus Highway Junction over here. Once in possession, we can present it to Celevis and claim our reward, the Magic Scorpion Charm. This charm significantly boosts magic damage. Having fulfilled our commitments to Celevis, it's time to part ways by handing the Fingerslayer Blade to Rani, so that we gain access to the Karen Study Hall, and from there we can make our way to the Divine Tower of Leonia, where at the top we can pick up the Curse Mark of Death, which is important for Fia's quest line, which I will be doing on the side, and uh, we can also grab uh, the Stargazer heirloom talisman there, which increases our intelligence by five. So with Celevis and Rani's questline done, I will now dedicate myself to Fia and Dee's questline. Weathered dagger. It was once a special weapon of gold and silver intertwined. Gold and silver intertwined. Hmm. Oh, Fia, what have you done? Finally, it is returned to its rightful place. And now, I must bid you goodbye as well. Following Fia's mysterious disappearance, our journey takes us to Siofra Aqueduct. Here, we encounter an NPC covered in a blanket. Handing him these belongings is a poignant moment before we proceed through the impending boss fight.
exhausting. Okay, we got it. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. After conquering the challenging battle, we can rest in a nearby coffin, which will transport us to the deep root depth. Here, we can uncover the staff of the Death Prince. In this area, we also find the throne of the Death Prince, where we must defeat fierce champions to be able to reunite with her. After defeating her champions, you find Fia leaning against the corpse of the Death Prince in the far end of the arena. Now it's time to embrace her once again. Finally, we can hand her the curse mark of death. Once Fia falls into a deep slumber, we can enter inside her dream realm and fight a formidable boss. I am equipping myself with Rancor Pots into my death poker for this epic encounter. What did I do? I picked the fucking wrong button again. Oh god damn it. What are you doing now?
Yeah, I think now it should work, though. <sighs> Come on, I don't want to do this anymore. Come on. Okay. Upon respawning back at the side of Grace, we will find Dee's twin brother hovering over Fia's dead body. It is not necessary to kill him, however, because in this playthrough I am on Fia's side, I'm gonna go ahead and will unalive him. Oh, I'm on Fia's side. Sorry, Fia. I'm so sorry. I couldn't help you. Now that we're done with the deep root death, I could actually utilize this portal here and transport myself to Landel. However, before I make the journey to Landel, let us return back to Aldous Plateau and pick up the Celebrant's Skull weapon, which is a great hammer type of weapon. With that done, it's time to make our way to the outskirts and find the tunnels which hide the miners' bell bearings so that we can upgrade our weapons. We do find the smithing stone miners' bell bearing inside a chest, so the area boss is actually not necessary for us to defeat, but while I'm already here, I might as well do so. Please excuse my chewing. I got really obsessed eating this candy and I just, I just couldn't contain myself. I, I apologize. Oh no. Next we're going to the Altus Tunnel to snatch the Sombristone Minus Bell Bearing 2 from the Crystallion bosses at the far end of the tunnel. Jesus Christ! him dead yeah I don't care Jesus Christ <sighs> alrighty for the next section I have to find Estelle and for that let's go back to the deep root depth and use the coffin which will transport us to Ainsel River Main from there we need to navigate to the lake of rot and cross it to arrive at the grand cloister in search of Estelle it's essential for me to defeat Estelle so that I can acquire his remembrance. Once I have obtained his remembrance, I can deliver it to Inia in exchange for the Waves of Darkness Ash of War, which I will then equip onto my Celebrant's skull.
Please don't hit me or I will honestly cry. Now that we have defeated Estelle, let us make our way to Inia. Receive power from Remembrance, Remembrance of the Natural Born, and we will get our hands on the Ash of War Waves of Darkness. It's finally time to go to Landel, and for that I am using the portal in the Deep Root Depth. Having arrived in Landel, it is now time to use my Celebrant Skull, which I have upgraded all the way to plus 12, and I have also equipped the Waves of Darkness Ash of War onto it. With that, it's time to get started with the second half of the game. That was pretty easy. That was pretty easy, I must say. Crazy. This weapon plus 12 hits. It hits. Uh, with the market, I actually want to try the Ash of War. We will see. I don't know how well, how well it will go. What's going on?
With the market defeated, we will make a huge uh, jump to the mountaintops of the giants, where here I will pick up uh, two new weapons. The first one being the Halfin Steeple, which is trapped by the Tibir Marina here in the mountaintop of uh, giants. The second weapon is the Death Ritual Spear, which is dropped by the Death Rite Bird in the mountaintop of Giants. I'm simply going ahead and simply cheating this boss using my Night Maiden's Mist standing atop of a cliff, conveniently placed above the Death Rite Bird. was it thank you very much as we ascend the mountaintop of the giants we reach flame peak yet before proceeding to the forge we shall make pause at the church of repose here we will be invaded by bloody finger okina triumphing over okina will reward us with his mask enhancing dexterity by three his mask is much needed for the fight with the endgame boss Having vanquished Okina and gathered all the necessary smithing stones, it's now time to advance toward the forge. However, our progress is impeded by the presence of the next boss, the fire giant. Before we can set the earth tree ablaze, we must first conquer this formidable adversary. For this intense battle, I'll be wielding my death poker. I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. They're doing that. Oh, that is not cool. From this point onward, the struggle intensifies as I find myself grappling with precision. I often miss my timing, reaching the giant a tad too late. This delay hinders my ability to inflict significant damage as the giant rolls away by the time I cast Ghost Flame. The situation is palpable, leaving me with little recourse other than to hope that Frostbite takes effect soon. This 
is so bad. I can't believe this. I don't think I don't think I ever had this much trouble with this guy. Oh, this was really difficult. Oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know how I'm gonna do a farm Azula. Honestly, I have not a single clue. This is so difficult. After igniting the earth tree at the forge, we find ourselves in farm Azula. Apart from advancing toward the looming boss battle, our options in this area are limited to gathering additional smithing stones and minor spell bearings. With these tasks accomplished, it's time to press onward to face the godskin duo. For the first part of the battle, I'll be using the Sword of Saint Trina, which is renowned for its sleep-inducing properties. I've come to categorize sleep as dark magic, which was briefly mentioned when we picked up this sword in Kaelid. The strategy for this encounter revolves around first lulling the lanky apostle into a deep slumber before engaging the corpulent noble. The sword of St. Trina's sleep-inducing effect surpasses that of conventional sleeping pots, providing a significant advantage. Once the duo is in a slumber, I unleash my ghost flame for maximum damage. Although this strategy may seem straightforward, mastering the execution took several attempts. After the intense battle, our next destination is the Dragon Temple, where we must find Alexander. He challenges us to a warrior's duel. Upon defeating him, he rewards us with his shard, which we can add to our pouch. This shard significantly enhances the attack power of skills by 15%. Witnessing Alexander's death always brings a sense of sadness. With Alexander's shot equipped, our journey takes us to the Great Bridge for a showdown with Malekith. In this battle, I'm eager to test the Death Ritual Spear, which I acquired at the mountaintop but haven't had the opportunity to use yet. I don't think this is doing a lot.
The death ritual spear deals area of effect damage, but its attacks land in a predicted spot. Due to Malekith speed and agility, hitting him at the right moment becomes a challenge. This prolongs the fight unnecessarily, making it feel like a difficult and tedious task. Essentially, I find myself waiting for the opportune moments, repeatedly going through the cycle, hoping the spear's attacks connect with Malekith and that he doesn't evade by jumping away. Well, that's done. Alright. Oh god, I can't believe I now have to go through all the other bosses. <laughs> Arriving at Lindel, now transformed into the Ashen Capital, after the Urtree's destruction, we encounter a new obstacle. This time, Sir Gideon Ofnir emerges as a boss blocking our path. To navigate this troublesome encounter, I've opted to employ my Ritual Spear. Its efficient AoE damage and swift casting speed make it an ideal choice for cheesing this fight. We will see about that. We will see about that. <laughs> I really don't know how far I can get with this get with this uh, build, dude. I don't know how I'm gonna deal with Huralu. Not a single fucking clue. After numerous trials and errors in the battle against Huralu, the final boss, before confronting the end boss, I've decided to let the health and steeple shine by relying on its assistance. This fight demands a great deal of precision, particularly in executing a sequence involving stance breaking and inflicting frostbite on the boss in a specific order. This precision is crucial to enable a subsequent stance break once the fight transitions into its second phase. As the second phase commences, I employ a charge attack for the necessary stance break, followed by utilizing the death poker for its ghost flame ignition. Successfully executing these steps required me to enter the fight with medium load, a choice I rarely ever make.
Oh, dude, I can't believe I had to go like medium low just for the little bit of last part there. I have returned back to Leonia to the Scenic Isle since we now need to deal with the death bird. I'm gonna climb up there. Now you st you stay wherever the fuck you are, but you don't come up here. I forgot to turn on the music, right? Eh, it's fine. Okay, so here we go. We have gotten the red feathered branch sword, which I'll be using for my fight with Redagon. Please don't be confused that the music was off. I always turn it off before fighting Redagon. I simply forgot to get this talisman and therefore the music was already off. Okay, with that we can now return back in the showdown against the final boss. I've opted for the death poker and equipped the Okina mask to benefit from its additional dexterity attributes. This choice comes as a result of exchanging all my talismans for those specifically boosting my weapon art. Okay, so here we are at the Fractured America, the side of Grace, and we have finished the game. I can't believe it, that was really, really tough. And since I am a Dark Mage, I'm going to use the Mending Rune of the Death Prince. That is why I did the questline, Fierce questline. And I really hope that you did enjoy this gameplay, that you enjoyed this run, and I'll see you next time for another challenge run. Make sure to stay tuned. I'll see you around. Bye. The fallen leaves tell a story of how a tarnished became Elden Lord. In our home, across the fog, the lands between. Our seed will look back upon us and recall the age of the duskborn.